Hello, my name is Andrei Hrobov and I'm the lead developer of CatBoost on Spark implementation. Today, we are going to talk about CatBoost on Spark. But before that, I will provide some information on CatBoost in general. The intended audience of this presentation is data scientists and data engineers, people who apply machine learning techniques in practice. So we will focus on practical aspects and not machine learning theory. For those who are interested in the mathematical and algorithmical foundations of CatBoost, you can find the relevant papers on our website, CatBoost AI. So, what is CatBoost? CatBoost is a machine learning algorithm that uses gradient boosting on decision trees, or GBDT. We will briefly recall the basics of GBDT in the next few slides. And it is available as an open source library with a permissive Apache 2 license. So it is both free as in freedom, as in free as in beer. Let's start by talking about data that is used in machine learning. Here you can see one way to classify types of data used to solve practical problems today. Firstly, we have so-called unstructured data, like images and video, where deep learning techniques are currently dominating. Secondly, we have tabular or structured data. Well-engineered features are used to describe a sample, we used to make predictions. Features are typically float numbers, and integers are a subset of float numbers. This type of data, the state-of-the-art results are achieved by GBDT. Let's recall what are decision trees and why they are still so powerful. Decision tree is a simple structure with a, some condition in its nodes and some values in its leaves. In a simple case, model leaves contain final predictions. Also, there could be more complex leaves with additional values, like for example, for serial classes, and even formulas in them. The main disadvantage of decision trees is that it's really hard to avoid overfitting, or even full memorization of the training dataset. That leads to less than optimal generalization abilities of such models. On these slides, we have an example of a decision tree that is a simple binary classifier that answers the questions, is object a cat? On some objects with Boolean features like, is it an animal? Does it have whiskers? Or does it purr? Gradient boosting on decision trees. This technique is very easy to use and it has a really small number of parameters that you have to tune manually to achieve good quality of the model. For GBDT, it is often enough to use just three parameters, a maximum depth of the tree, a number of trees you want to train, and a learning rate. And that's all. You can spend the rest of the time working with the data, not with model parameters tuning. Rating boosting works well on small data sets and scales well to big ones. And this method allows you to accurately check and avoid overfitting. You could look at the target loss function values change on a validation set and stop training when it stops increasing and starts to decrease, or even cut some trees from a model after training. What distinguishes CatBoost from other GBDT libraries? First, CatBoost takes its name from categorical boosting. It means that the main focus of CatBoost originally was to provide sophisticated categorical feature support. You can read about it in the detail in papers and in the other educational materials on our website. And recently, CatBoost also added additional feature types features derived from text and embeddings data. Other distinguishing feature of CatBoost is it supports training with pairs, which is very useful for ranking problems. This feature is widely used in Yandex search. We spend a lot of time tuning default parameters of CatBoost to make it work with pretty good quality with default parameters. CatBoost standalone model applier is fast. It is one of the most important features of CatBoost. Also, CatBoost supports exporting models to the variety of common model formats, so you can use it with multiple training and inference ecosystems. CatBoost has many model analysis tools, including calculating feature importance, sharp values, and sharp interaction values. And at last, it's important to mention that CatBoost is stable and used in the production environment as well as for scientific research. Well, let's discuss feature types supported by CatBoost. The first feature type is the most common one, and features are real numbers, or integers, which are actually a subset of real numbers. Common examples are features like length, weight, and other measurements of something. Decision trees work well with such features. Decision functions in the nodes are predicates that compare a real value with some threshold that is selected during the training. The second feature type is also common. It is when features take a limited set of distinct values. It's very common that there is no order between them, so we cannot use comparison with thresholds. 
like we did with numerical features. They are often transformed to the binary numerical features using one hot encoding, but there are more sophisticated techniques that can give better results. Catbox uses them, but the details are beyond the scope of this talk. See the relevant documentation on our website. Sometimes features are less structured and contain texts in the raw form. Catboost has the built-in support for such features without additional preprocessing steps by external libraries. Embeddings represent another type of complex features. Their values are vectors of real values of fixed dimension. The sources for embedding mapping are usually some weakly structured data like texts. Real valued vector representation is much more mathematically and algorithmically convenient. Catboost has some built in support for embeddings as input feature data. Catboost supports an extensive list of popular model formats. Catboost native format is the primary file format used by Catboost libraries. Cornemail is a model format used primarily by Apple ecosystems. ONNX is a well known model format for neural network models, but it also supports some machine learning model types like examples of decision trees, which Catboost uses. PMML is another common model format. And finally, it is even possible to export Catboost model as source code in either Python or C++ programming language. Such options are most library independent, and the compiled C++ code can be quite performant. Here is an example of training model analysis. One of the popular techniques for analysis of feature importance and impact on the trained model is sharp values. Here is an example from a tutorial on our website of sharp values visualized by a trained CatBoost model. As I've said, CatBoost is stable and production ready. CatBoost has been originally created by Yandex, a leading big tech company of Russia. CatBoost is extensively used throughout Yandex, and one of the most important and demanding use cases is the ranking of the results of the main Yandex web search engine. Data is very big. Data sets can reach up to several terabytes. For such demanding tasks, multi-host and multi-GPU training is used. Let me now show you some use cases of CatBoost outside of Yandex. The first big example is Netflix. It uses CatBoost model as a part of its recommendation system. Another example, ranking hotel offerings for avia sales airplane ticket booking system. It helps them to show the most relevant offers. In Cloudflare, CatBoost model is used to detect bot login attempts and protect against them. Also, CatBoost model was a part of CERN particle classification. It classifies particles, muon, proton, another type of particle. Also, CatBoost is used ML contests on Kaggle. And of course, it's not an exhaustive list. So, why implement CatBoost on Spark platform? If you're listening to this talk, you most likely already have a pretty good idea what Spark is. In a nutshell, Spark is a leading big data platform in the world, and it's open source. The first case when CatBoost Spark could be useful is when your data size is too big for a single machine. It doesn't fit into RAM, so any operations on it are very slow. Or even worse, if it is beyond the limits of your permanent storage, like SSD and HDD. Even if your dataset sizes are within your local machine hardware limits, you might want to utilize extra distributed processing power to take advantage of parallelism and perform your data operations faster. As I've said, Spark is a leading big data processing platform in the world. It has an extensive API for data manipulation using SQL, Java, Scala, Python, and R, and some common machine learning algorithms implemented as libraries in the ecosystem as well. Another reason is that low-level data processing in Spark, Scala, Java API is faster than Python API, typically used by data engineers and data scientists when they're working with data locally, using libraries such as NumPy, Pandas, and Scikit-learn. While these libraries are well optimized for common operations, if you have to manipulate data on the low level with your own functions processing individual data elements, it's typically very slow when in interpreted language as Python. Most widespread Python implementations also contain global interpreter lock that limits the ability to write multi-threaded code. Standalone CatBoost library doesn't have API bindings for 
training and model analysis on GVM platform. You can only use CatBoost prediction package to apply models trained using other platforms. So CatBoost Spark now fills this gap and allows training and model analysis with GVM API. Note that PySpark API is also supported by CatBoost Spark. I am sure you have expected that, but yes, CatBoost Spark API is fully compatible with Spark ML library. It means familiar interfaces, data compatibility, and other common usage patterns for Spark ML practitioners, and possibility to include CatBoost processing into Spark ML pipelines. Here is a simple example of how to use CatBoost Spark with PySpark API. All the usual patterns work as expected, creating classifier with parameters, saving it to Spark supported storage, training on data frames with columns in usual formats, and then saving the resulting models to Spark supported storage, and finally applying the model on data frames. On this slide, you can see the feature comparison of CatBoost Spark with our main competitors. Note that the features mentioned are Spark implementation specific. So, for example, standalone CatBoost libraries support GPUs and there are ping for R. The mentioned features are GPU support. We are working on supporting distributed GPU training with Spark API. Categorical features. CatBoost has more extensive categorical feature support and it extends to Spark implementation as well. Pairs training. A special model of training uses ordered sample pairs as a target signal for training instead of individual labels. This feature is especially useful for ranking problems. Prequantization. CatBoost allows to optimize processing time and memory requirements if the same dataset is reused multiple times by prequantization of numeric features. We will discuss it on the next slide. PySpark and Spark R are APIs to use Spark from Python and R, respectively. PySpark is fully supported by CatBoost Spark, where there is no Spark R support at the moment. One important step often used in GBDT algorithms is the quantization of real-valued features. It is useful because it's very computation-intensive to search over all possible splits between data points. So the common technique is to partition the real line for each feature into bins by so-called borders and consider bin borders for split candidates instead of all possible splits between feature values in the dataset. There are multiple techniques to choose borders, ranging from simple uniform partitioning of the observed range to feature values in the dataset to more complex techniques that try to choose borders in such a way to maintain uniform density of data points for each bin between borders. You can see such an example on the right side of the slide. The detailed discussion of these algorithms is outside the scope of this presentation. Quantized datasets are also usually much more storage efficient. Depending on the number of borders, one feature can now be stored from one bit, if it is only one border, to one or two bytes, up to 255 and about 65,000 borders, respectively. CatBoost consider up to 255 borders by default. So dataset size is typically reduced four times, from four byte floats to one byte bits. For Spark, it's even more advantageous, about eight times, as Spark MMLib typically stores features in vectors with eight byte double values. If the same dataset is used for training or other uses like feature analysis multiple times, and the quantization procedure parameters are the same, you can save processing resources and memory if you pre-quantize this dataset and catch the result using pull quantize function. On this slide, you can see some benchmarks comparing the performance of different GBDT implementations on Spark. This is the final slide. Thank you for your attention. Here are some useful links about both CatBoost in general and about CatBoost Spark implementation in particular.